Hi everybody, welcome back to the Tenth of an Hour with Griffin Bridgers. For today's episode, episode 53, I'm going to bravely venture outside of my wheelhouse a bit into areas where I don't really have knowledge as an attorney, but I have a little bit of knowledge, not necessarily practical, but more academic in terms of my exploration of certain subjects dealing with family money and the themes that surround that and the issues that can pop up. So we're going to dive into those a bit today, but uh, with a couple caveats. One is that this presentation obviously is not legal or tax advice, but also that I have no expertise in therapy, psychology, or mental health. So really what I'm doing is, um, you know, espousing ideas that might factor in here and approaches without necessarily advocating that I am an expert in any of these fields. But my hope is that in shining light on this, we can show how there's this growing trend towards the need to have this type of professional who can wear two hats, both as a fiduciary potentially and as at least a student of psychology when it comes to family money. Now, overall, family money is one of those things that really kind of bubbles under the surface and really drives a lot of the uh, values that children grow up with. You know, money has always been used as a tool, both, you know, from the physical perspective, the mental perspective, and even from the emotional perspective in a family, regardless of the level of wealth. Now, these themes are common across families, and they just kind of tend to exacerbate themselves as you move up, up the chain into ultra high net worth families and, you know, the colloquial, sometimes, uh, you know, tongue in cheek type of label of trust fund babies and things of that nature. And the challenge in any sort of estate planning is capturing the use of family money and how it's used as this tool to perpetuate values in a way that can be enforced through a legal document, especially because typically somebody in a fiduciary role is charged with carrying out those values and the use of money to perpetuate values. And there's lots of challenges, obviously, if you brainstorm that can come up in that. And the, the sky's the limit. We can't really capture all those, but I think it's important too to look at in family money, you have constantly conflicting generational values as well that are driven not just by family, but by the general zeitgeist of society and the generation as well. Now, I don't mean to use any of these labels as uh, my, you know, endorsement or, you know, insensitive view of any sort of generation, but I, I kind of cite some examples here where, for example, in the Depression area, you had a lot of people driven by frugality, by need, necessity. With the boomer generation, you had money kind of equated with loyalty to an employer, to a cause, to a party, and we're seeing a lot of that play out today in politics. Um, you know, with Gen X, we saw the rise in the 80s of yuppie culture and the use of the money or career as a status symbol, which kind of faded out because that was overridden a lot by the millennial generation where, you know, this was broader, where money was used both to show off and to fuel the need to escape from the general societal pressures that were brought on by social media and things of that nature and a growing technological society and growing expectations in, you know, vocation, education, so on and so forth. And then finally, you know, my view of Gen Z is just asking, <laughs> will there be any money left once we get through, you know, everything we're going through right now, rising costs, the potential for rising taxes, coronavirus, everything else like that. So, you know, there's lots of ways that you can look at this by generation in terms of who is still around. But, the biggest challenge in family money is basically asking, can a fiduciary replace a parent in terms of perpetuating these values? And also the fact that fiduciaries tend to be cold and corporate because they have to by necessity. Uh, the fiduciary duties set forth under law and fiduciary policies that really enable fiduciaries to create a skeleton around activities don't necessarily take into account any sort of emotional element, but there is an emotional element to family money, and fiduciaries 
typically are not equipped to deal with this emotional and psychological piece. And I think in the future, we'll see some fiduciaries who kind of have to go that route or at least have access to, you know, psychology and mental health consultations on behalf of a beneficiary when it comes to this. And that kind of fits into ascertainable standards, especially with health and education, because those tend to be wide open. And obviously, mental health can be addressed in health and education. And I think it'll need to be increasingly in the future. But where you see the bigger conflicts come in, and this is where emotions really are driven, as in maintenance and support and reasonable comfort and welfare, those are all areas rife for conflict because, you know, nobody is really honest around these and nobody really, you know, is straightforward and blunt with their expectations. If you're a beneficiary and you say, I want money to be able to show off on social media or I want money to crank into drugs or something so that I can, you know, numb the pain of realizing, you know, my, my trite existence, then those are conversations that rarely take place. And I think that fits into health and education that the two are interchangeable. You're going to have to see more of a trend towards that and, you know, just brutal honesty in the realm of family money and what role does it actually play. And the problem is below the surface, there's a certain level of programming that we're about to look at in a, in a minute. Programming tends to follow money across generation regardless of the source. So it's rare that people actually acknowledge and are honest about this programming and it tends to just naturally run in our subconscious and get perpetuated and nobody really stops to ask does this programming continue to serve a purpose and is money the best way to perpetuate this purpose if it is indeed valuable or could money be used to even deprogram to enable a more fruitful beneficiary a more fruitful heir who can you know actually thrive in general life. So there's a couple, you know, psychological theories I want to briefly examine, and none of these are things I'm, I'm experts on. You know, this is really just kind of my academic research that I'm applying. But one I see being very valuable is family systems analysis is a first um, you know, introduced by Murray Bowen, which really kind of looks at the family as one emotional unit where the individuals de-emphasized in favor of, you know, the family's identity so that each member of the family has to know their role and their place and pay their dues. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, theories out there on where will formalities originated from in common law Britain. But, you know, I, I think this is really the the genesis of a lot of our will formalities because estate planning originated around the idea that one golden child inherited the estate and the non-golden children had a lot of incentive to defraud their parents and thus we had the genesis of will formalities from a time when children often didn't share equally in the estate. But when we look inward at the family, money is often used as a carrot and a stick to maintain this family identity and each individual role, and also to maintain the flow of emotions among the family members. So triangulation is the biggest common tool espoused in family systems theory and by Bowen, where things like guilt and shame can be used to program and change behavior internally within the family itself. Now, you can also look external outside the family, and this is where I find that Alfred Adler's um, you know, theories especially come into play, where children are often programmed from the beginning naturally and by their parents with a sense of inferiority. Now, that inferiority happens within the family itself, especially when you compare siblings to each other, but it also looks outward here outside of the family to a situation where you know the community and friends and institutions in general become the driving force of that sense of inferiority as well so this is really kind of one of those pieces that extends now into our mod modern educational institutions social institutions our work institutions and even our political institutions where money is the carrot and stick used to perpetuate inferiority for purposes of driving hopefully quote unquote 
greater achievement, once again using the tools of guilt and shame to program individuals and change behavior. But this is less of a triangulated internal theory within a family itself and looks more at a one-on-one -on -one comparison or a 30,000 foot view or a one-on institution comparison. So you might see a lot of uh, language around this with things like a beneficiary saying what will quote unquote they think if I do something or don't do something but there's a difficulty actually identifying the they when you're looking at the Adler type of psychological analysis. So these are just some ideas around family money. Obviously I'm not an expert on this but uh, hopefully this is enlightening to you if you work in this space. As always if you have questions or topic suggestions feel free to email me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of the tenth of an hour and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.